clocks, computers, and time. Those are the parts of the alien cortex that I was talking to you about last time. Now, you may remember that I said there were two types of time, Kairos and Kronos. Kronos is chronological time, sidereal time. We only know about that kind of time because of the revolution of the Earth and its rotation, uh, its orbit around the Sun, and the movement of the stars and planets. The other type of time, Kairos, is really experiential time. So, I always think of a clock more like something that doesn't exactly tell the time, it more like cuts the time. It's like a knife, it slices Kairos time. So, think of it kind of like, like this. If, you, if you're having a, a wonderful sensory massage, uh, a time massage, for instance, then it's a deep experience. And so Kairos expands outwards. Anything to do with pleasure or pain, a deeper experience, uh, kind of dilates Kairos time. And then suddenly your 20 minutes is up, according to chronological time, bing, and that's the end of the massage. It kind of cuts the experience of time, and ultimately it cuts off your life. And I think that's why Carly's carrying a sword. She's, uh, she cuts off your life, cuts it short. Now people talk in terms of climate change action as reducing CO2, but there's another way to look at it. Uh, you could just say that you extend the time. I mentioned that it would be better to move towards a more Kairos time. So in other words, you'd have m intermittent manufacturing. Uh, you'd have intermittent power. You would live according to basically the nature, nature's dictates. So then basically when the sun shines, you make hay is, is the kind of example of that. Here we are right at the edge of extinction. And what we really need is not less CO2, not less emissions, not less consumption. We really need more time. If you spread those emissions and that consumption out over more time, you achieve the same result. But it's far easier, in my view, to campaign for free time, to campaign for leisure. So time in all respects, in terms of your work week, in terms of the, the rate that we actually consume. Saying you must reduce your emissions is kind of like saying you must poop less. So you can't say don't eat so much and don't poop so much and expect that to be a popular message. But what might be more popular is take time, slow down your consumption. You see, the entire economy has been put on this hyper intensity mainly by economists, and this economist idea of keeping the velocity of the economy going. So reducing that velocity could help the nature, the environment, and in general just the CO2 emissions with a more positive message. Now essentially the entire economy is just a giant oxidation reaction. Really what the entire economy that the economists love so much boils down to is really just taking essentially carbon and adding O2 to it to create CO2 in massive amounts and by the same token taking iron and oxidizing it to FeO2 or FeO3 rust. That's all our economy is. It's basically burning carbon matter to produce CO2 and essentially steel to produce rust. But economists have been saying since Joseph Smith and David Ricardo that the economy must burn bright. It's all about increasing the intensity and heat of this civilization uh, reaction, which is really just a chemical reaction, an oxidation reaction. So what we need to really do is either have less people participating in that reaction or otherwise reduce the rate that that uh, reaction happens. There's a well-known principle in software called the iron triad. And what that is, is conceptually a triad of time, quality, and money. As the saying goes, pick any two you like. So in other words, you can have a quality product in a very short time, but then you'll pay lots of money. Or you can have a quality product and have it cheap, but then it'll take a long time. 
Either way, you get the picture. Now, the same applies in the economy. There's something like an iron triad. And what we should be doing is expanding out the time component. We should be saying we have oceans of time, oceans of time, and then quality improves and price comes down. And we have this expansion of time. This idea of efficiency cramming things and churning this rate is really comes from slavery. It's trying to maximize profit. And we need to de-incentivize profit. So the alien cortex wants more time. It wants to live. It wants to really be immortal. But in the West, we've got into the habit and our slave system of driving, cranking the handle harder to achieve more life. The secret to longevity is kairos time, not chronos time. Expanding the intensity of experience is the important thing, not increasing the pace of experience. And that's the trouble that we've got to in the West. That's where our whole civilization has got to. Increasing the intensity, making the slaves work harder so you have more money that you can party harder. But it's really stopping and smelling the roses is where you actually pack more into life. You have richer memories. And it seems that really chronological time has expanded. So getting back to Kairos, is an important part of what we need to do to get even slightly back on track. Even if we're going extinct, we want to expand as much time as we have. And the way to do it is not to party harder, to have an end of species party, is to slow down and have a richer, more Kairos type of experience. So slowing down is really becoming more like a hunter-gatherer and it's really unpopular. On Exxon's Reddit sub, I wrote something about really uh, re reducing the economy, not intensifying it. And somebody said, well, we're not exactly going to ban electricity. But if it's a question of surviving as a species or banning electricity, which would you do? Because that probably is something like the choice we have now. Our species has known electricity coming out of a wall socket for such a short time. But the chances of us giving it up and going back to kind of our hunter-gatherer lifestyles really fills people with kind of terror. So economists have told us that with hunting and gathering you don't have many options. It's boring because really there's only one profession and that's hunting and gathering. And they say that now you have so many choices with specialization. You can be a doctor or a lawyer or a banker, or you can go and be a factory worker and tighten widgets all day for the rest of your life. You see, the economists have been duping us because in our society, as once you've chosen a profession, you're stuck in this tiny, narrow profession for the rest of your life. It's very boring and very uninteresting. They're no generalists today. A hunter-gatherer's lifestyle was a million times more interesting than the average office worker. They're living kind of like Peter Pan. And in Kairos time, they're having a rich experience. Their day is filled with rich experiences. We, in our modern society, sitting at a desk in an office, we have a tiny slice of that experience. And therefore, the economists are dead wrong. We've got to the stage where our lives are exceedingly boring. And now we rely on electronics to make our lives even vaguely tolerable, just make them slightly interesting. But it used to be that in a hunter-gatherer or rather indigenous people today, it's pretty much like being in the movies, full immersion. And the lions and tigers that leap out at you are real. So there's real genuine excitement in the day of a hunter-gatherer. So why did the alien cortex push us into this boring, humdrum life in the pursuit of immortality? Well, mainly it's to become transhuman. It's trying to supersede the older layers of your brain, the primate and mammalian, reptilian and fish parts of your brain. All of those are corrupt and mortal, according to the alien cortex. It thinks in terms of life and mortality as corruption of the flesh. And all the lower five layers make for corruption. But 
The alien cortex sees itself in an abstract, pure world. This is exemplified by transhumanists. This brittle world, this pristine, clean world, not corrupted by the flesh, seems to be the route to immortality. And that's where transhumanists are going. Our entire civilization is really a project to become transhuman, really for the alien cortex to subsume the lower layers of the brain that it feels are subject to corruption, subject to nature, and imperfect. It sees its pristine logic and rationality as some kind of insuperable perfection, and nature being the enemy. Here, let me read an article that was written by a transhumanist because it so epitomizes what the alien cortex is all about and hence what our civilization has become. The title of this piece is called Environmentalists Are Wrong. Nature isn't sacred. We should replace it. So uh, the, the graphic is a picture of technology, big arrow, you know, sign, uh, a road sign with technology, big arrow, and then uh, nature underneath it, another sign crossed out. So the direction is not nature, the direction is towards technology. And the reason why is exemplified in this article, and I'll put a link to it below. So the byline on this is, what we're doing to the planet is not as important as what we're achieving as a species, entering the transhuman age. For the transhumanists, they kind of imagine themselves being uploaded to silicon, whatever that means. It means that your thoughts are pure and a computer is really just an alien cortex brainchild. So it can basically contain your thoughts and all you are thoughts. Now a neurologist will tell you this is bunk. You're, you have neurons all the way down. So without a body, you're not a person. If you can't experience what your body is experiencing in a fully integrated way with the five other layers, then you just aren't there. So the alien cortex is not your mind. It's just a small, tiny piece of your mind, in fact. But uh, to the transhumanists, I guess they assume that if you upload it to silicon, then uh, you would just program in the sensual experiences and basically you would just be in the matrix. And of course, in the matrix, you can just, as long as you can power it, uh, then of course you never die. And so that's this kind of weird logic that really underpins a lot more than just transhuman nuts. It really underpins most of what has happened in our century. So what he says is, on a warming planet bearing scars of significant environmental destruction, you'd think one of the 21st century's most notable emerging social groups, transhumans, would be concerned. Many are not. Don't worry, we're kind of aloof from uh, human habitat and nature, don't need it. Transhumanists first and foremost want to live indefinitely. Bingo! That's what it's all about. And they are outraged at the fact that their bodies age and are destined to die. And that's the alien cortex in a nutshell. They blame their biological nature and dream of a day when DNA is replaced with silicon and data. You don't give a damn about the people whose lives you're throwing away. We're not just machines. Mr. Hobson, you will carry out my orders or I will relieve you of duty. That sentiment has really been underlying our entire civilization. As we stand at the brink of extinction, it's really, that's what's responsible for it. That's been the driver underneath our civilization. The civilization itself is an artifact of your alien cortex. And the bid for immortality is the bid for the computer, really to make a matrix, to, to make a virtual world that your thoughts and brain can live in so that you don't need this harsh, corrupting nature where Darwin said that everybody was, everything was competing, red in tooth and claw. It's a vicious world where everything eats off each other and eventually dies. So the alien cortex is trying to subsume it all the way back to religions, to, to this heaven where there's no more struggle. Everything is perfect. It really is a matrix world. But here's what happened and here's what's going to happen if we stick with this plan. Of course we're going to go extinct. 
we can't divorce ourselves from nature because we rely on nature and we can never make the leap away from nature to basically being divorced from nature permanently. So this idea of abstraction and idealism it goes all the way back to Socrates and Plato. These guys are really Neoplatonists. And our society and civilization came from Greece on this Platonic ideal to really construct an immortal, perfect, pristine, logical, reasonable, uncorruptible world. And that's what we're in the pursuit of. But we'll inevitably fall short because this Promethean quest destroys the environment that re our real carrier relies on. It's not our carrier, it is us. We are this flesh and blood. But the alien cortex refuses to believe it. And that's pretty much why I call it alien cortex, because it's a thin rind of bark on the outer layer of our brain. It's really a, a neurological newcomer in evolutionary terms. But it sees itself as somehow alien to the rest of our body and alien hence to nature itself, the world itself. If you ask a lot of people what mankind's greatest achievement was, many other people would say it was getting to the moon. Now, getting to the moon was really an exercise in applied mathematics. What underlies this drive to transhumanism is mathematics. It really is applied mathematics. Our whole world, the computer included, jet travel, rockets, they've all been underlined by ma mathematics. Our world has been shaped by mathematicians. Now, that may seem a bit strange because the average person can't normally name even five mathematicians off the top of their heads. I think it's true to say that most people think of mathematics and arithmetic as some kind of absolute. It's almost the definition of a truth to say that one and one is two. But I must admit, that I've never really shared in that certainty. I think it's probably due to my childhood and upbringing. So I had a very unhappy childhood. And so from a very early age, I came to the conclusion that all adults were untrustworthy, unreliable. But what that gave me is a great skepticism of everything adults said. So even at the age of six, when I started to learn in, in primary school, about basic elementary arithmetic, I saw that there was a kind of a fraud in it. I was good at mathematics in school, but I never believed in it. It was always kind of uh, a silly game. Uh, and I was always struck by how other people didn't see it that way. So let me kind of explain the difficulty I had. This is called adding. If I have two beans, and then I add two more beans, what do I have? Some beans. You have one. Now you have another finger, and that makes two. Take away one finger, and what are you left with? One. But you're not. It's a fraud. Just because you've got one finger behind your back doesn't mean that that finger's gone away. There's still two fingers. There they are. Baldrick, the ape creatures of the Indus have mastered this. Now try again. <laughs> One, two, three, four. So how many are there? Three. What? And that one. It's really just saying, what do you have in a frame? You can't really take that finger away. When I take this finger away and put it behind my back, the finger's still there. So I found out later that I was in good company with my incredulousness about basic arithmetic. Socrates, too, had difficulty in seeing why one and one suddenly made two just because they were next to each other and put them further apart, then now suddenly it's one again. It makes no sense. You're saying, now it's in the frame, now it's out. Essentially, it's probably something that goes back to cattle herders. But really, it's how the cattle are in the pen or out the pen. And really, it's in your frame of reference. The cattle can't disappear, just like your finger can't disappear. There's conservation of matter and energy in the universe. Whatever you do to this finger, there's still two fingers. You can't take one away. There's nowhere to put it. Nature doesn't work like that. It's just an artifact of your brain. Now, this view of mathematics and arithmetic is called psychologism. 
and it was roundly hated by logicists. Logicism is an ism, just like fascism, only a lot worse. The history of logicism in the late 19th century has been whitewashed. What's been airbrushed out of the history is that actually there was a secret agenda. There was actually a social agenda underneath all this purest mathematics. It's really a kind of revenge of the nerds. It's the idea that we could be ruled by an artificial intelligence. The will to totalitarian dictatorship is really part and parcel of your alien cortex. Its history has proved time and again Wetware intelligence, your biological intelligence, your alien cortex, is subject to corruption. As soon as you get a powerful dictator, no matter how benign, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. So the solution is to get an artificial intelligence that's uncorruptible. It's fair because it's constructed to be that way. And it can be validated by validating its construction. And that's the hidden agenda that now has been totally expunged from that history of the 19th century that bleeds over into the 20th century. So imagine the perfect world that a logician or a mathematician would desire. The draw of mathematics is that it's absolute, it's certain, it's total, it's unarguable. Whereas the natural world is messy, it's capricious, it's subjective, it's very arbitrary. So imagine a mathematician's frustration with uh, the social realm. For example, many studies have shown that if you are sentenced by a judge in court before lunch, you're liable to get a much worse sentence than after lunch. Basically, if the judge is hungry and... Uh, not in a very good mood, you're liable to get uh, maybe years and years of your life thrown away for such an arbitrary reason as the fact that he's just being a little grumpy. And after lunch, assuming he has a good lunch and a good glass of wine, you might have your sentence halved. Now, isn't that terrible that people's whole lives hang on whether a judge has lunch or not? And the, the studies show that that is actually the case. So, now, as an anarchist, you would say, well, yes, that's why we shouldn't be sending people to jail. That's why we shouldn't have judges. But logicians are not like that. They say, no, 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 no. We need judges. We need judges. We need punishment. It just has to be non-arbitrary. It just has to be perfectly reasonable and logical. It has to be evidence-based. And then we're off to the races to totalitarianism. So the dream hidden within the formalism of mathematics is a dream for totalitarian control. Now, of course, humans and alien cortexes are compromised, like judges, before and after lunch, by the rest of their brain and their brain layers. So clearly, alien cortexes in the wet, as biology, are not perfect. But the dream has always been to have a perfect alien cortex that's freed of the body. And that has become personified today as the computer. So the computer goes back very far. The, the contenders for the first computers go very far back indeed. So really some people would claim that Leibniz made the first attempt at a computer. It, it was basically a step reckoner is what it was called, and it basically is just an adding machine. Set numbers on a dial, put in a few pins, crank the handles, and you can do addition, multiplication, even division. So a machine that could do arithmetic was the first step in an idea that you could have a perfect machine for governance of everything we do. And this idea never goes away. The idea of a silicon totalitarian machine that then would govern us in perfect harmony, in logical perfection. And that is the dream of post-humanism. So if we can't actually become post-human or transhuman, at the very least we can have a dictator that has supreme power and nobody can question that dictator because they have been constructed on the basis of logic and reason. And that's part of what 
is hidden behind the story of uh, mathematics in the 19th century and the mathematics after Leibniz and his calculating machine. Now in order to make this God machine, Leibniz realized that you would need a programming language, a formal programming language that was absolutely foolproof. He called it the Characteristica Universalis in Latin, and this is where the problems started to crop up. So people like uh, Godlob Frege was concerned that even something as simple as 1 plus 1 equals 2 does not really have a firm foundation in formal mathematics, and so he thought that it needs proofs. So Frege's attempt to put mathematics on an absolutely firm foundation is the first step so that basically when you have a totalitarian oracle, a god machine, this artificial intelligence that rules every tiny bit of our lives, then it can't be questioned because it's imperative that no one can go back and say there was a flaw somehow in its foundations, that somehow the machine itself has actually been corrupted just like any tin pot dictator. Now, in putting mathematics on a firm footing, an amazing thing happened, which I think is enough to undo the entire civilization project. We really should have had a complete review in the 1930s about what civilization is and what it's intended to do, because I don't believe that it is just about goodies and nice things to have and basically making more resources. That's just the packaging. Underneath it all is a totalitarian desire, and this desire comes out again and again and again. For example, you can take the Venus Project. The Venus Project, again, is this idea that humans are corruptible. So then we need artificial intelligence to manage the resources, to make sure everything is egalitarian, everything is fair, everything is managed in such a way that it's logical, it's neat, it's uncorruptible. And then you get, say, things like the Zeitgeist movie. In the Zeitgeist movie, Peter Joseph again comes up with this idea that we need this artificial intelligence to manage us down to the finest details. And then we will have a perfect world. We won't have all this rather selfish uh, intelligence that really totalitarian intelligence tends to favor itself and gets corrupted. But we could build a machine that didn't have that flaw in it. But the problem is that that machine would then have to be unquestionable. That machine would have to be beyond criticism. And because it would be based on formal logic and arithmetic, basically computing methods, you would have to put computing on an absolutely firm footing. And since computing is really working with numerical methods, Arithmetic itself was assumed to be really a formalism of logic. So Frege started down this road of proving that really mathematics stands on an unquestionable footing right down to 1 and 1 equals 2. This project didn't go very well. Just before Frege was about to publish his uh, masterwork, his grand opus on formalizing mathematics, uh, Bertrand Russell came out and showed that there was a paradox. Two days before this book went to print, uh, Frege found uh, that there was a paradox in what he was trying to do. So what he was trying to do was basically what I said before, is put uh, in terms of set theory, 1 plus 1 is equal, equal to 2. In other words, formalize what I just said about the alien cortex sees in frames, and you know, you put... Uh, these elements inside these sets, and then therefore you're home free. You can then deduce that uh, counting numbers are uh, map evenly to the elements. Uh, you can have uh, a formalism right down to the nitty gritty of number theory and hence arithmetic. So, what Russell pointed out is that if you have this naive set theory, it would be possible to have a set of all sets that are not members of themselves. Now think about that. What about the set itself? Is it a member of itself? In which case then it's not a member. In which case then it must be a set of all the sets that are not members of itself, which in, case, in that case it is a member. So in other words, it's a paradox. 
And Frigga suddenly realized that there was no way around what Russell said. There were more and more of these paradoxes filtering into mathematics. You can kind of uh, imagine. They, they go back very far. They go back all the way to Epimenides. So Epimenides' famous liar paradox. Uh, it's saying, uh, this statement is false. Well, is it? Of course, if the statement was false, well, then it's true. But then, of course, it would be false. Hmm. Frege couldn't find a way around Russell's paradox, and his whole system was crushed. He never really went near the subject again and abandoned it. Now into the frame comes David Hilbert. Hilbert thought that all of these were kind of pathologies of mathematics, and mathematics could be cured, could be put on a firm foundation so that the bigger program could go ahead. The formalism of mathematics could be made absolute. There's an old Latin saying, a maxim that goes ignoramus et ignoramibus, which means we do not know and we cannot know. In other words, knowledge is finite. What we can actually prove with mathematics has limits. But David Hilbert thought that that was absolutely not the case, that there was no limit to mathematics. There was nothing that you could not prove given that it was true. In 1900, at the very turn of the century, he gave an address to the International Congress of Mathematicians that met in Paris. Hilbert vigorously opposed the Latin maxim. He said that in mathematics there is no ignoramibus. We can know and we must know. And with that, he launched the Hilbert program. Hilbert took up the cudgels and phrased the fight in the form of a fall of culture. He felt deeply that the whole 8,000 year project of civilization would actually fall on its face. Culture and civilization itself would fail if ignoramibus was the truth. So he set out with vigor to prove that it wasn't. In his address in Paris, Hilbert challenged mathematicians with 23 unsolved mathematical problems. Important amongst those was a challenge for a proof that mathematics was consistent and complete. And then a further problem that all problems in mathematics were in principle decidable. To see how important these three aspects are, Imagine, for example, that you had to stand trial if you were accused of breaking one of this artificial intelligent god machine's laws, for example. If you stood trial in front of that machine and it could be called into question for one of those three reasons, for example, say for example that you were innocent, but it was absolutely impossible mathematically to prove you were innocent. That would be a disaster. And consider, for example, that it was inconsistent. So therefore, in some respects, there would be a paradox. And so you couldn't be found guilty or innocent because you might be a juxtaposition of both. You would be in this kind of Russell paradox uh, situation that couldn't be resolved mathematically. That too would be fatal. And the final problem that all problems in mathematics are decidable are crucial because it would be fatal if the machine went out to deliberate uh, and then never came back. It just couldn't come to a conclusion and calculated forever. That too would be fatal for this totalitarian god machine. Now Hilbert thought all of these things, like most mathematicians, were absolutely a given. It never occurred to him that it might come back that mathematics was actually inconsistent. That was absolutely unthinkable. That it wasn't absolutely complete also was unthinkable. It's unthinkable that there are statements that can be true but are not mathematically provable to be true just didn't enter his conception. Although he realized that to put mathematics and formalism on a firm footing, he would have to prove it mathematically. But it seemed like a slam dunk. And the same with the decidability problem. It became known as the Entscheidungsproblem, or the decision problem. It took three decades for the results 
of Hilbert's program to come back. But when they did, they were absolutely seismically catastrophic for the philosophy of logic and the philosophy of mathematics. In 1931, Kurt Gödel, an Austro-Hungarian mathematician, published a result on the incompleteness theorem, in which he proved absolutely and undeniably that mathematics, surprisingly, was inconsistent or incomplete. So it meant that there were genuinely statements that were true but unprovable in mathematics, and a result that nobody, especially Hilbert, never expected. Part of Gödel's result was something like the Russell paradox. Imagine the mathematical equivalent of this statement. Imagine an axiom that said, this statement is unprovable. Well, if the machine could validate that and say, yes, that is a valid statement, it is unprovable, that's true, well then, it's actually provable, which makes the statement false. So just like Russell's paradox, it's kind of in between true and false. Those are both really circular and valid arguments. And there's no way out. Then in 1936, Alonzo Church and Alan Turing independently published papers that showed that the Entscheidings problem was impossible. From that moment on, I feel in my heart of hearts, the entire civilization project, based as it is on logic and reason as absolutes, fell to bits. I feel that we should have abandoned civilization at that point with Kurt Gill's results, Church's and Turing results. It meant that the whole foundation of our civilization was built on sand. It was arbitrary. It was not an absolute. Logic and reason were not infallible after all. In order to prove that the Unchidings problem was impossible, Turing, in effect, had to invent the computer. The modern computer was invented in his paper, just in a thought experiment, in effect. And what it did was to show that the, it was impossible to tell, in his parlance, whether a program halted. So, not a lot of people realize that a computer, the formal name for a computer that you commonly encounter in the workplace, is actually a universal Turing machine. And Turing's machine that he invented in his paper on the Unscheidings uh, problem was to show that uh, some problems were undecidable by just looking at their form and function. So in other words, uh, they couldn't be validated without actually executing them. And you would never know whether the problem came to, say, a halt, or otherwise it would run infinitely. So, for example, it might be something that's a print statement that just says, uh, print once, hello world. Now, that would print hello world and stop. But it might be something uh, like a condition. If one equals one, then uh, print hello world. Well, one will equal one forever. Therefore, hello world will be printed forever. But you couldn't really tell if uh, perhaps it was, while well, one is less than a hundred, then print hello world and increment one. You wouldn't know if your program was just running extremely long, or otherwise it was on a problem that was genuinely undecidable. In all of these things, the problem seemed to be, in Kurt Gödel's case and Alan Turing, seemed to be self-reference. And mathematicians have tried hard to exclude and quarantine self-reference. So, in essence, Russell's paradox is self-referential. It became known as something like the Barber's Paradox. What the Barber's Paradox is, is imagine an island where uh, it's just populated by men. And all the men who don't shave themselves are shaved by the barber. The question is, who shaves the barber? Because if he doesn't shave himself, then the barber's supposed to shave him, except he is the barber, then he would shave himself, and then the barber's not supposed to shave him. So those paradoxes had a kind of Escher-like self-reference 
that still today mathematicians try and quarantine, but not successfully, because just like Turing's undecidability problem, it could be a very, very long loop of logic that resulted in self-reference. So not only is uh, self-reference not the only issue. So take, for example, a Mobius strip. A Mobius strip is easy to make. You just get a long piece of paper, twist over the ends, and glue them together. Now, if an ant walks along that strip of paper, it can walk along infinitely. Uh, it's basically a closed, or rather a closed, but infinite loop. Now imagine statements written down the strip of paper before you fold it into a Mobius strip. Imagine you say, this statement refers to a number that is less than the previous statement. This statement refers to a number that is less than the previous statement, and on and on and on. Basically, you could loop forever. It would be something like the computer equivalent of Bach's endlessly rising canon, which creates the auditory illusion of a tone that continually ascends in pitch, yet which ultimately seems to get no higher or lower. It would be infinite, it would refer to a specific number, but that number would be elusive all the time, except there still isn't self-reference in it. And it seems to me that that's another example where it's not entirely due to self-reference, and it's certainly an example where you can't actually quarantine mathematics, make it, make it whole again by just excluding self-reference. And there's a bigger problem with self-reference is, is surely an oracle machine, a god machine, could prove itself. And what Kurt Gödel showed, that basically because of its inconsistency and incompleteness, then uh, you can basically have uh, one or the other, but you couldn't get some uh, system of axioms in mathematics to completely prove them themselves. There would always be an axiom that escaped them, and uh, that axiom then uh, could basically be included in a bigger set of uh, systemic algorithms. But that too would have uh, what Kurt Gödel showed would be some statements that were outside it. And so you would have to get an ever bigger system to describe this system. It's rather like uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. They commissioned two of their brightest and best to design and build a stupendous supercomputer to calculate the answer to life, the universe, and everything. In the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you may remember that Douglas Adams had this god machine, this oracle machine that was uh, going to decide uh, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Basically, the answer to uh, Hilbert and the ignoramus et uh, ignoramibus. Return to this place in exactly seven and a half million years. The answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is... Forty-two. So the answer to the Idnoramibus turned out in The Hitchhiker's Guide to be forty-two. And if you remember then, they had to go back and make a bigger machine to pose the question. But the sheer devastation of this result of Turing Church's and Gödel's results should have changed the course of history, I think. But instead, as always happens with the alien cortex, it just moved the frame. Under complete threat, its entire program, our civilization, had, had, had the entire rug pulled out from underneath it. But all it did was move the goalposts. What uh, mathematicians, in essence, did was said, that's a very interesting machine, Turing. Do you think it could be done practically? And we were off to the races with the computer. Imperfect, incomplete, and inadequate as Turing's machine was, it was actually implemented. And after the war, it came to dominate our whole lives, so that now they unimaginative, stultified. They run by the clock. Turing's machine is a clock. The stultified, unimaginative uh, world we live in today, the boring world, heading towards puritism, without creativity, without surprises, 
this brittle, dead, crystalline world of our alien cortex has now come to dominate. So it never could dominate in the way that the alien cortex hoped, that it would be an absolute, something infallible and unquestionable. But it is a working substitute. So we've had this hodgepodge of an idea that the computer can perfect our lives if we just stick with it. It can make us transhuman and we can become a computer eventually. And that's the essence of our civilization in its bid for immortality. Immortality through transhumanism. Now you might say, well, is this really all this fatal? Who cares about these results of Turing and Gödel? I mean, you can still use mathematics to build bridges and aeroplanes and get to the moon. The problem is, why are you going to the moon? Why are we flying in aeroplanes? Why are we building bridges? They're just to get from A to B. It's really so that we can rearrange things. We're not creating anything new by manufacturing a widget. We're just rearranging things. When we take things out of the ground, like oil and fossil fuels, and burn them, we're not creating anything at all. We're not even creating movement. We're just rearranging the physics. And that's what economics, and arithmetic even, fails to comprehend. That you don't have one thing created, and another thing created, and have something go away, and have something go away. That's how mathematics works. That's not how the physical world works. What economists have failed to understand in the arithmetizing of the natural world, and the accounting for it by arithmetic, is that the natural world is a whole, it's an absolute, and there's continuity and preservation of energy and matter. So all we've been doing by creating bridges and planes and going to the moon is just rearranging things. We didn't put a man on the moon, we didn't create a man on the moon, and we didn't make a man on the moon disappear. We just rearranged the situation in nature. And nature does that best. We've tried to subsume nature, and it's been pure folly. Now we live in a brittle world that's going extinct, that can't actually manage itself. And we need to scale it back. We need to go back to Turing Church and Gödel and say, what are we doing with this civilization? Where are we trying to get to? What is this economic perfection? What is the intent of this fake accounting of the economists? This arithmetic that makes no sense that denies the fact that there's no creation and destruction. There's just rearrangement. And why are we rearranging things? We're just creating a world that's brittle, boring, dead, sterile, predictable, unimaginative. It's stultified. And in the end, it's destroying the environment. We're arranging things in such a way that the essence of life is dribbling away through our fingers, through this artificial intelligence, this idea that we can be super intelligent and pass the limits of mathematics. But there are absolute limits to mathematics. And it was logic and reason that showed that logic and reason is fallible and has limits. And a society has yet to come to terms with that. Here we sit, almost as far advanced into the next century as into the one where it was proven that we are on a fool's errand. But we're still hanging in there. We're still hanging in there with greed new deals, with this idea that you can have zeitgeists and Venus projects, artificial intelligence that will be super intelligent and can sort out our problems. The very problems that were created by rearranging this world according to a logic that is fallible. Yet no one seems to realize that, appreciate that, and no one teaches that. So we need an entire review about what we've been doing. And we need to ask ourselves, do we want to live by the clock? Or do we want to live by Kairos? There's no such thing as created wealth or destroyed wealth. That was the mistake of the economists. They convinced us that we were creating things and destroying things, when in actual fact there's only rearrangement. There's only a rearrangement of the things that are. Why would you want to rearrange things other than the way they were after billions of years of evolution 
before civilization started. The only reason is because you want to escape the rules of nature. You want to escape the norms of nature and in particular you want to escape death. But in escaping death you've done an environmental and evolutionary suicide. It's crazy. Our system is crazy. Our whole society and the world is crazy.